welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. So in today's program, we'll discuss the changing Orthodox family and how we minister to them. Our guests today are Reverend Father Constantine Citaras, director of St. Basil Academy, also the director of the Center for Family Care of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Also Presbyteric Harry Pappas, welcome. She is coordinator for seminarian and clergy couple care at the Center for Family Care. Welcome to the both of you. Thank, Thank you. you, it's nice to be here. Father Costa, let's begin with you. This Department of Family Care is a relatively new department for the Archdiocese. How many years has it been in existence and why did the Archdiocese feel the need to create it? It began about eight years ago. As director of St. Basil Academy, we have a large, beautiful facility and His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius had called me into his office and said, we have to think about creating something for families. He, he had a sense even eight, nine years ago that families were in some type of crisis here in America culturally and religiously and, and universally in America. And, and we met several times and came up with the concept of having a center for family care. That didn't happen initially as a physical place. It's happening now. But what we did do is have a round table on, on family concerns. We met several times, people around the country, crystallize our thought, and then began a ministry initially with volunteers. Now we have uh, two full-time and three part-time people in various ministries, family ministry, and as, as Carrie has mentioned, um, seminary and clergy couple care, which is a long-time dream of my own. So it's evolving, it's happening, and it's very timely. It's, it's very much in need and very exciting. I mean, we're very, looking forward to doing very, very many good things in the future. And Presbyteric Kerry, what are some of the issues that you're looking at? What are some of the needs of the couples who might be helped through this department? Well, in terms of the couples and the life of the church, we have a lot of mixed marriages these days, probably 60 to 80% of our marriages are interfaith marriages. Is that across the United States? Yes, yes. And the, the statistics that we have are not the most accurate simply because some people, some of our people are getting married outside of the Orthodox Church and we don't have statistics for them. And increasingly, we have uh, Orthodox, young Orthodox people who are marrying people of other world religions too, not just Christians. So those, those are issues that the church, that, that creates many challenges for the church and, and some wonderful challenges in terms of embracing lots of people, bringing, recognizing that the church is for everybody, the church is universal. But how do we do that when we are used to being a Greek Orthodox church, beginning with immigrants from Greece and now evolving into second, third, fourth generation Greek Americans, and now with the increasing number of interfaith and interreligious marriages. So when we talk about these mixed marriages, I'm assuming that we're talking about the couples that still attend an Orthodox church, even though one spouse may be outside of the faith. Is that right? Yes, who st still attend or have some kind of a connection. They may bring their children to the church for baptism, but not maybe members in terms of name, but not necessarily active members in the life of the church. And is there a concerted effort on the part of the church to try to convert that spouse or just to lovingly include? I think the latter. I think lovingly include. I think the Archbishop has made it very clear that we should reach out to all people. And like Carrie mentioned, we, we need to create an environment where they are welcomed. And that will help tremendously. I mean, I, I, I travel quite a bit still, and I'll meet a parent who says, my, my son fell in love with a girl. They got married in the church, but she's really not active, and we just embraced and loved her. And you know what? After a few years, when you're part of something, and it's a loving, caring, nurturing family called the Orthodox Church, then more than likely you are going to be a part of it, a really intrinsic part of it. And that's our goal. I, I think Carrie mentioned the immigrant population. It was really closed off. Initially, initially we, we had our own little community. It was based around the church. Everything was, was the church. 
You went to church, you went to Sunday school, you went to Greek school, if there was a parochial school, your friends were all Greek. That's not the case today. It hasn't been the case for many, many years. So it's a little bit more challenging, but challenge equals opportunity. And we've got the opportunity to really witness and minister and grow the church in this particular way. I happen to think God's giving us a wonderful opportunity to really grow the church. So what kind of services are provided there? Do you do counseling or do you just set the, the agenda for parishes across the Archdiocese, Presbyterra? Personally, do I do counseling or, or, or are you asking there? generally in the church? Yeah. Well, most couples now go through pr some kind of premarital preparation and the premarital preparation is sensitive to the reality that we have many interfaith marriages. So those who choose to be getting married in the church often go through either some kind of group premarital program or some one-on-one -on -one with their priest or a combination of both. And even sometimes in group settings with, with the clergy too. So there's some real sensitivity in that um, in terms of the challenges and opportunities that these couples will face as they enter into married life. What choices are they gonna make about where their children are baptized, where the children are going to be raised in the church? Is the one person gonna to continue to attend his or her church and the other, the Orthodox church, are they both gonna be attending together? Will only the Orthodox parent be bringing the, the children to church? Where will their level of activity be in the life of the church? And these are all issues that exist in a vacuum prior to having a family, prior to getting married. And they're very real issues once the family comes. Do you ever find that as a result of this premarital counseling, some couples say, you know, we just can't meet in the middle. It's not going to work for us. It's been my experience with premarital work that usually other issues help to a couple to determine that they may not want to get married. It's not, not usually issues related to matters of faith and practice of faith in the home. Usually they're able to resolve those and the premarital preparation gives them an opportunity to actually discuss these things ahead of time and to make some decisions so that they don't, they don't hit a wall when it's time to make the decisions and they have to make them. Father Costa, what other issues do you see when we're talking about interfaith marriages? Um, well, cultural differences. I, I, you sort of hinted at it that people become married in normal life and they're bringing two fa family cultures together and that's hard enough. If one is Orthodox Christian and the other one is not and, and even Protestant, Roman Catholic, it's, it's, we're still different, it's still very different. So a, a lot of premarital work needs to happen. I think raising the children is an issue. The premarital program is called Journey to Marriage. It was created by Father Charles Joannides and Dr. Philip Mamalakis. And our goal as an organization is to get it throughout all the parishes so that everyone getting married in, in America will be able to have this opportunity to, to go through it and be educated uh, in the pitfalls of marriage and the issues of marriage and open some dialogue and hopefully a, a base where they can grow from that point on. Um, do some decide not to get married? I've heard of instances where that has happened because of revelations that they've learned. But it's really preparing them so that we prevent um, or, or give them the opportunity to know they can go somewhere if they have issues later on in marriage. I mean, the idea would be a premarital, a, a one-year checkup, a five-year checkup, a 10-year checkup, but you need manpower, you need ability, you need funding for it, but that would be the ideal. And I, you know, create that kind of sense of community where I know I belong and I can get an ear and then some guidance. We know the divorce rates are fairly high in this country. It's been quoted as something like 50%. How does the church view divorce? Presbyterra? Well, the church in its compassion and economia allows divorce because the church recognizes the, that there are instances where divorce is necessary and where it's better for the two people. It's, it's a last resort, but the church, it's a compassionate move on the part of the church to allow divorce and to allow up to, th to three marriages in a lifetime. Should a couple seek counseling from their priest? Is that appropriate if they're having marital troubles? Priest is an appropriate place to begin. And if the priest is not equipped to do therapeutic work, but simply to provide pastoral, to provide pastoral care, then hopefully he will have referrals for couples to go to, to appropriate therapists and then in conjunction with the work that the therapist is doing to provide the pastoral care that the couples need. And it's very important when couples are in trouble that they don't wait until the very end and until they're desperate to go to their priest. 
It's important that he be part of it, be given an opportunity to love and support them through the process. Father Costa, you've been instrumental in the lives of many uh, Greek Orthodox children. You were the director of the Ionian Village for 25 years. 25 years. 25 years. You still manage to retain your sanity after that? I do. <laughs> For those who may be watching and don't know, give us a brief description of what Ionian Village is. Ionian Village is a summer camp program created and run by the Archdiocese, but it's, it's located in Greece, in the southern Peloponnesus of Greece. And um, it's been in existence since 1970. My last year was 1996. And the current director is a young man who came as a camper and, and came as a seminarian and, and now is running the program and I'm thrilled and tickled pink. But uh, thousands, literally, probably 11, 12,000 young people have gone through it. And uh, what it helps to do is not only cultivate the depth of spiritual life in young people, but their commitment to the church, their understanding of the church because it's church universal. Young people come from all over the country. And, and leadership abilities, they, they get it. They understand that they're part of this thing called the church and they wanna do more for it. It's, it's really unbelievably rewarding and fantastic. So you've seen many, many children in I your have. career. You both have children, grandchildren mm -hmm. perhaps as well. Would you say parenting is more difficult in this day and age than it has been in previous generations? Um, I think I would. I think it's more challenging. We. Um, when we were a smaller community and around that church family, I think it was a little bit easier because you not only had Yaya and Papu, but you had all the, I grew up calling every, every Greek I knew Theo and Thea, which means uncle and aunt, and thought that they were biologically related to me until I became 24. I mean, uh, and, and, <laughs> and they but probably that, reprimanded you of and course, helped they you kept grow. you in line. Right. And if they saw you doing something, you, you were called to task for it. That's not the case today. I mean, we've, we've very successfully become part of the mainstream and very successful in it, but we've also lost something. And um, it's, it's our responsibility, all of us, to really create opportunities for that to be there, for community, the sense of community to be there as, as an Orthodox Church. Not easy to do, but very possible to do. But as Vitera, what are your, what's your take on child rearing uh, in the year 2013? or 14 or 15 mm. into the future. That we're, we're isolated. Our, our nuclear families are much more isolated than they used to be. Um, our, our children are overbooked, overscheduled, and there's very little t church and the life of the church is one more activity that needs to be fit into the schedule rather than being the center of the family's life. And I think that the, and the support that the church can provide, the sense of community, the sense of love, it has really been lost because families tend to live their isolated lives and maybe go to church on Sundays, but not really embrace the life of the community. And I think that makes parenting much more difficult because there is no real support system out unless you have extended family around for parenting and for raising children in godly homes. And you believe the church can be viewed as an extension of family, I guess in the right circumstances, if you feel a connection to the people there, to the priest there. I know in my church, yeah. uh, since the beginning, when I started attending there, how many years ago, 15 years ago, I felt like this is, these are my people, and I hope everybody feels that way. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the sense of community that you, we want to have, absolutely. Now, I am Greek Orthodox from birth, and so I understand the Greek culture as well. Now we might see how somebody who is not of that cultural background may feel a little mm, disengaged. Do you find that? That's probably one of the issues that you Absolutely. deal with. Absolutely, and sometimes when young people come into the church who are not of Orthodox background and are engaged or already prepared to be married or are married and they walk into the church, and they walk into a language that's completely foreign to them, and it, it, it's so disconnected from their daily life that, that for some people, it's something to embrace, and for others, it's something that, that's very difficult for them, and it makes it very difficult to feel embraced when you walk into a church and everything is very foreign to you and has very little connection to your daily life. I'll give you just a per quick personal story. My husband was not Greek and was not Orthodox, but he did convert. And I remember him talking to our priest at the time, and he was telling him, I want to convert for Stacy. 
And our priest said, no, you don't mm -hmm. want to convert for Stacy. You want to convert for you. Do you run into that attitude as well? And do you direct people into <laughs> a different path? Uh, um, I, I haven't so much. I think when, whenever they've, um, I, I think they do it for the right reasons. When I, I haven't been a parish priest, so those instances aren't very many in my life. But the few that I have encountered, they really, it was more of belonging, coming to church with the spouse, having the children baptized, and all of a sudden after one or two years saying, you know what, this is home. I belong here. So it's for myself that I convert. But as Vitera is speaking about, going back to what we were discussing earlier about somebody not of this cultural background coming mm -hmm. into it, um, a very lovely young man who's in our parish brought a woman that he would like to marry. And she is not also of an Orthodox faith. And um, after services on Good Friday, they all went home and uh, with his family and they said, okay, write down any question you may, might have. And the iconostasio, and if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in our church has a big eye at the front. That was one of the things she said to me. She said, okay, what's with the big eye? But I thought it was a beautiful way for mm -hmm. the family to explain to her questions about the questions she had and also interpret it for themselves too. Would you recommend that for other families? Absolutely, and that it, but in order to be able to explain those things, we have to be knowledgeable about what, about the church and about the faith. So this is where adult education and nurturing family ministry so that the adults are learning, the children are learning, we are all learning as families so that when others ask questions, we, we know the answers to them. Do you feel like the adults know enough? No. No, it's, it's interesting because um, at St. Basil Academy, which is a residential home for children in need, we have about 30, 40 adults that come with their families. And I, I gear my teaching sermons to the level of the children, and, and just about every Sunday I've got the adults saying, I never knew that. So yeah, we've, we've, not, we've not done a very good job in doing that, of teaching. Um, so why the I, Stacy? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> Father. Thank you for putting me on the spot. I think the, the all the God sees all seeing everything. I, yeah, all knowing. All the omnipotence of God. Yeah, I, I Is that, did I pass the I test? I think that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about but, clergy families because both of you are intimately involved in that by way of your own lives. And mm -hmm. presbytera. First, explain what presbytera means to those who don't know. Well, presbytera is a title given to the wife of the priest. The priest is the presbyter. The the presbytera is the title given to his wife. And you were in seminary, so I, I'm assuming you met your husband there? Yes. And so you yes. knew that this was going to be his, life, his path in life? Yes, I did. And you signed up knowing that? Well, I signed up knowing that that was going to be his path in life. Did I sign up knowing what I was getting into? <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't think any of us really do. What did you get into? Well, into a, a life where my husband is the head of the community, the leader of the community, and where our family is called to be part of that community. And there's a very unique relationship because of that, because of his leadership, and especially in a situation where the priest is called upon 24-7 sometimes, and it's all in the name of Christ, and all in the name of the church, and all for the purpose of serving and loving people. It's a life of a lot of sacrifice. And I knew that here, entering into it. But when you're living it, it is something that, that's very different than, than what you might anticipate. It's difficult. And, it, and many use the language of that it's a life in a fishbowl because our, our life is very public in many ways. And, and my husband is a public figure. Their expectations, both internally and from the community, about who he should be and what he should be doing. Their expectations on me, and those vary from parish to parish, and often dependent on my, our predecessors. And then their expectations that we have these perfect children. Too. I was going to ask you, uh, how about your parenting? Do you feel like mm -hmm. you maybe couldn't discipline them quite the way you wanted to because the parish was watching? We made the choice to just simply be who we are and not to put expectations on our children that you need to do this because you're the clergy child, you need to do this because your dad is the priest. We tried to simp we raised our children as best as we could without placing expectations on them. 
Um, because you always hear about the priest's child or the pastor's child rebelling. Mm -hmm. And there's a saying in Greek, the son of the priest, the grandson of the devil. <laughs> so we do see some of that too. Not, not literally, yeah. but that's a, that's a saying that's very well known in Greek. So the, the children, as much as you try to insulate children from feeling the pressures of being clergy children, PKs, which they're often called, um, the kids do feel it some. They know that their dad, their mom, that the family is, is being watched. And we are somewhat set up as models for the rest of the community. And Father, can you speak to, you weren't the head of a parish, but certainly you have responsibilities and have been very important to the lives of many people. What pressure did you feel? Um, that's a good question. I, I think the expectations on me were from a, a different area, and that's the hierarchy. Not that I wanted to when I was in this holy grounds, this place going to school. I never wanted to be that close to bishops and archbishops, but it, as it turned out, I was. And so having that kind of pressure was on me personally, but thankfully my family was insulated. They, they didn't really have to experience it. And um, going to Ionian Village the summers was a joy for the family, my son and my wife. Being at uh, this place I'm at now for the last 15 years called St. Basil Academy, we have a sense of community, and I am the head of that organization, but really it's very different. Um, I've got a staff, I work with children, I, 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 we try to meet their needs, we tend to their needs, they, and, and I think we do really solid good work in, in raising them. So. St. Basil's Academy, as you talked about, was a, was a home for troubled youth, sometimes for orphans. Well, orphans and broken homes. And really broken not homes. troubled. We're not... We're not we don't, um, don't want to yeah. use that term. Right. Okay. And um, what peer pressures do those children face and the other children in our Orthodox community? All, 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 everything that every other child faces, um, unfortunately, in today's time. And more so for the St. Basil kids, because somehow they have a stigma of being in a child care institution which uh, they're resilient and, I, and I'm amazed at them and they're my heroes because they, they go to public school for high school and, and they not only survive but they achieve. So you see them fitting in and the church is very important to them which pleases me to no end. I think in, in a regular parish life, what, what Carrie mentioned is the pooling of, of all the activities we have to go through and, and she said plugging in the church and that's the basic difference between today and 50 years ago. The church was our life, was at the core and center of our life. Today, we've got to fit it in somehow. Um, as Vitetta, talk to me about single parenting. What challenges do those adults and those children have? Well, a lot of those challenges are financial, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've seen primarily single mothers in, in, in our experience who very much struggle simply to make ends meet. And, and sometimes the church is there to be able to support them financially if the priest has a discretionary fund and is there in, or through philoptochos, confidentially giving to these families. But the other piece of it is those, many of those children who are living with the mother do not have a consistent male role model in their home, which is really important in terms of growing up and being a healthy whole person. And sometimes the, the clergy family can help to provide some semblance of that and the, the priest can perhaps become a father figure to those children. Let me ask you, you've seen in other faith communities um, how they stress the importance of fathers because in particular communities, mm -hmm. fathers are absentee um, at an alarming rate. Does the Orthodox Church have that issue? Do we struggle with that? We do. Uh, we have single, single parent and mothers more than not. Um, it, it's a, there was a study done, and Carrie, you might remember, but something I'd heard years ago that when a father is actively attending church, mm -hmm. even if the mother is or is not, if the father is actively attending church, something like 70% of their children will continue going to church. Right. That's, that's a very telling statement, isn't it? I mean, it, it shows the importance of the fathers, and somehow we diminish that here in America. The, the, the role of the dad isn't that important. I think that's the sense I have, but it really is. 
Uh, do we have that issue in the Orthodox Church? Sure, we're not, we're not excluded from any of it. Um, how do we deal with it? I, I hope that we offer a supportive environment. The, um, the children of St. Basil have a mother in their lives, nine out of 10. If they have a parent that's alive, and um, we, we try to support them. Do I become a father figure? I do, um, obviously. And we have some really strong male staff that are loving and caring and nurturing, and we've got some wonderful female staff that are the same. So that, that helps, it helps balance. And they do grow up seeing healthy male and healthy female role models. I, I, um, I think, for the most part, if, if they're connected, if people are connected to a church, they'll get it in the church. And but so, sometimes the single people still do feel a little bit stigmatized too, yeah, they do. and they feel like third they wheels do. sometimes. That's that's one of the challenges of the church to to embrace them, to love them, to to let them know that they are welcome and that they're that they're part of the community rather than than stigmatizing them and thinking of them as as somehow less complete because they're single parents. Another issue that I might imagine facing some Orthodox families is blended families. It's hard enough when you're both on the same page spiritually, you and your spouse, and then your children. There are children that come along who may sure. not be on board. Challenging and, and, and an opportunity. I, I wanna, yeah. theologically, I, I thought of this when you asked the question earlier, Jesus Christ came into the world to save all humanity, all humankind. He didn't say just the Greeks. He didn't say just the Jews. He came to save all people. So the church and her teaching is to do that. That's the purpose of the church, to bring people to Christ and save them for the eternal life. So with us allowing three, the church allowing three divorces, that's the purpose. For us nurturing and making welcome a single mom in a church, that's the bottom line. So our goal is to bring people to Christ, all people. Um, now, can we, can we not look at, at Greek or non-Greek or American or Xeni, I mean, my oldest brother got married 40 years ago, 50 years ago. He married Xeni, we're from the island of Chios in Greece, and his Xeni bride- being, being Farner, Farner. Farner, yes. Mm -hmm. And she was from the island of Rhodes, but she was a Xeni. <laughs> we laugh hysterically, well, times have changed. So, but Christ is there for all people, and I hear that loud and clear. And so family ministry, working with priests, yes, for the clergy, but for all people. So if it's a single mom, with 14 kids, what a fantastic opportunity to welcome and embrace and bring them home, give them a home. Let me ask you this phrase, katikon ecclesia. Ka katikon ecclesia. Katikon, katikon. what is Sorry that? For, and translate, please. It's the home in the church. St. John Chrysostom said, church begins in the home. So it's, every home is a church. So the question I ask, is your home a church? Think about that. If it's a church, they're being nurtured, they're being raised, they're, and we have simple things we can do as following a fast, doing our prayers, participating in the life of the church was not only sacramentally, but the services. Um, the ministries. The, all the ministries, all the programs, uh, and being part of this thing called the church. So when I hear of, of Agoya having an affair and a retreat or whatever, and, and non-Orthodox aren't allowed, <laughs> I, I don't know, you know? Um, is that not part of our ministry, to minister to all people? And show compassion and love to all people. Uh, Presbytera, if you were to give all of us a piece of advice on strengthening families within our faith, what would it be? What can we do? And I'll ask the same of you, Father, in a, in a I minute. I would say first that we, we become praying, worshiping persons and praying, worshiping couples, and praying and worshiping families. That Christ be central to our lives, that he not be left in the altar on Sunday morning, but that we bring him with us, we embrace him, and that he guides and directs what we do in our lives on a daily basis, the big decisions, the small decisions, and that he be central to our home life. And then after that, once we've become right with God, for lack of a better phrase, what concrete steps can we take? Then, then we love our neighbor as ourself. That we, if, if we are in Christ, if we are living in Christ, 
then we are going to become, be and become loving people and we're gonna reach out to others and we're gonna embrace them and we will love them and we will fulfill the mission of the church, which is, as Father said, to bring all people to Christ. And Father, final thoughts? Love the Lord with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and your neighbors yourself. And you know what? That's not a cop-out. That's, that's not a trite response. It's, um, if, if we're able, everything that Carrie said, but, but just be people of prayer. If you can have the sense, when you walk outside, when I walk outside, I'm in awe of this place. I mean, I, I spent years sitting in this, this chapel and looking at these icons. Well, when I came back, I was in awe. Um, when I step outside and I look at the beautification that's happened, I'm in awe of the hands of man, but driven by God. And that's, that's the perspective we have to have. Understand that we're part of this great thing called humanity, but we're all instruments of God. Just acknowledge it, recognize it. I tell the children, we want you guys to do well in school as well as you can. I want you guys to graduate high school, go off to college, and most importantly, be Christian. Most importantly, be Christian. I think in our society as Greek Americans, we're high achievers. We stress all of the above and we forget about being Christian. I, I don't know, I don't wanna be judgmental, but I think we gotta put that as the number one priority. Love the Lord with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. You know what, if we can't respect ourselves and our neighbors, what are we as people? Thank you so much. Father Costa Citaras, Presbytera Kerry Pappas, we appreciate your insight today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. And I invite our viewers to watch more programs in this series. It's called Discovering Orthodox Christianity. You can log on to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for joining us.